Thank you all for being here, especially in the rain today. My name is Maria LaHood. I am an attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, and along with Anand Swaminathan over here from the Chicago Civil Rights Firm of Lovi and Lovi, we are representing Professor Steven Salida in connection with his termination from a tenured position from the University of Illinois, where we are right now. As others will discuss, Professor Salida's termination raises profoundly important questions regarding free speech, academic freedom, and the growing tide of pressure to repress speech critical of the Israeli government. We are here among students who have just walked out of classes to protest Professor Salida's termination. Academic associations, including the Modern Language Association, have strongly condemned the university's actions. Eleven departments at Illinois, at Illinois have cast no confidence votes in the administration. <laughs> Thousands, it's around 5,000 now, I think, are boycotting the university. Lectures by several scholars and a national conference have already been canceled. The First Amendment is the foundation of our democracy and is most crucial at our universities, where open debates on issues of public concern tend to be at the forefront of our nation's most significant moral discussions. We must recognize that Professor Salida's termination has occurred in a broader national context in which powerful interests seek to silence and punish students and faculty who express criticism of Israeli human rights violations. The most common tactic, which has also been deployed here, is to falsely equate legitimate challenges to Israeli government action with anti-Semitism, or to label passionate rhetoric uncivil. On campuses across the country, over the last year and a half alone, there have been approximately 200 of documented incidents in which students, faculty, and activists have been intimidated, maligned, investigated, and even prosecuted for speaking out in support of Palestinian human rights. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And now, Professor Salida has been terminated from his tenured position at U of I for tweets about recent events in Gaza. Professor Salida's great crime is that he experienced horror and dismay at the loss of so many innocent lives in Palestine, and he reacted viscerally, not in a classroom or on campus, but through his personal Twitter account. But condemning atrocities committed by Israel is not uncivil, even if the speech is offensive to some. In fact, the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights has found as much in dismissing Title VI complaints against universities in California based on such spur spurious accusations. What is actually uncivil is the killing of more than 500 children that Professor Salida... And that is precisely what Professor Salida was reacting to. What is actually uncivil, and indeed unlawful, is terminating a tenured professor because he dared to speak out publicly and passionately about Israel's actions. What is uncivil is yielding to donor pressure in making faculty decisions. Indeed, the most uncivil action in this whole episode has been the university's resistance and refusal to right the wrong that has been done and to reinstate Professor Salida. <laughs> that action would restore norms of academic freedom, mutual respect, and in fact, civility. We understand that the Board of Trustees will be making a decision about Professor Salida's appointment, We understand that the Board of Trustees will be making a decision about Professor Salida's appointment this Thursday. We call on the Board to uphold the First Amendment and principles of academic freedom by reinstating Professor Salida at that meeting on Thursday. We are happy to first have with us right now to speak for the first time openly since this has happened, Pref Professor Stephen Salida.
Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back now? This is, I think, as loud as I can make it without uh, seeming like I'm screaming. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, though. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for, for coming out. This is a, a tremendous honor and it, it shows what remarkable students and, and faculty there are here at the University of Illinois. My, my name is Steven Salida. I'm a professor with an accomplished scholarly record. I've been a fair and devoted teacher to hundreds of undergraduate and graduate students. I've been a valued and open-minded colleague to numerous faculty across disciplines and universities. My ideas and my identity are far more substantive and complex than the recent characterizations based on a selected handful of my Twitter posts. I'm here today at the University of Illinois to speak against my termination by the administration from a tenured faculty position because of university administration's objections to my speech that was critical of recent Israeli human rights violations. The administration's actions have caused me and my family great hardship. Even worse, the administration's actions threaten principles of free speech, academic freedom, and critical thought that should be the foundation of any university. Since 2006, I've been a faculty member of the English department at Virginia Tech, where I earned lifetime tenure. On the basis of my scholarship and teaching record, and after substantial vetting, in 2013, I was enthusiastically recruited to join the faculty in the American Indian Studies program of UIUC. In October 2013, I accepted an offer from the interim dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to join the university as a professor with lifetime tenure, which I accepted. The offer letter specifically referenced the university's adherence to the 1940 principles of academic freedom codified by the AAUP. In preparation for my new position, I resigned my tenured position at Virginia Tech. My wife resigned her professional position at the university as well. We got rid of our Virginia home and took on considerable expense in preparation for our move here. Two weeks before my start date and without any warning, I received a summary letter from University Chancellor Phyllis Wise informing me that my position was terminated, but with no explanation or opportunity to challenge her unilateral decision. As a result, my family has no income, no health insurance, and no home of our own. Our young son has been left without a preschool. I've lost the great achievement of a scholarly career, lifetime tenure with its promised protections of academic freedom. As hard as this situation is on me personally, the danger of the university's decision has farther reaching implications. Universities are meant to be cauldrons of critical thinking. They are meant to foster creative inquiry and when at their best, challenge political, economic, or social orthodoxy. Tenure, a concept that is over 100 years old, is supposed to be an ironclad guarantee that university officials respect these ideals and do not succumb to financial pressure or political expediency by silencing controversial or unpopular views. I've devoted my entire life to challenging prevailing orthodoxies critiquing architectures of power and violence in the U.S. and abroad, and surfacing narratives of people, including Palestinians and Native Americans, who were subject to occupation, marginalization, and violence. The Chancellor and Board of Trustees are apparently displeased by messages I posted on my personal Twitter account that were critical of recent atrocities committed by the Israeli government, which the United Nations referred to as criminal. My Twitter messages are no doubt passionate and unfiltered. They reflect my deep dismay at the deaths of more than 2,000 innocent Palestinians, over 500 of them children. In recent statements, Chancellor Wise and the Board of Trustees said that the university administration found the tone of my tweets uncivil and raised questions about my ability to inhabit the university environment. This is a perilous standard that risks eviscerating the principle of academic freedom. My comments were not made in a classroom or on campus. They were made through my personal Twitter account. 
the university's policing and judgment of those messages places any faculty member at risk of termination if university administrators deem the tone or content of his or her speech uncivil without regard to the forum or medium in which the speech is made. This is a highly subjective and sprawling standard that can be used to attack faculty who espouse unpopular or unconventional ideas. Even more troubling are the documented revelations that the decision to terminate me is a result of pressure from wealthy donors, individuals who expressly dislike my political views. As the Center for Constitutional Rights and other groups have been tracking, this is part of a nationwide concerted effort by wealthy and well-organized groups to attack pro-Palestinian students and faculty and silence their speech. This risks creating a Palestinian exception to the First Amendment and to academic freedom. The ability of wealthy donors and the politically powerful to create exceptions to bedrock principles should be worrying to all scholars and teachers. Finally, my scholarship and strong student evaluations over the course of many years, along with the university's enthusiastic recruitment of me as a faculty member, thoroughly belie Chancellor Wise's only recently stated concern about my civility and respectfulness. As my colleagues and students will attest, I'm a passionate advocate for equality, a fair and open-minded instructor, and highly collegial. No legitimate evidence exists for any claims or insinuations to the contrary, which have severely damaged my reputation and my prospects for future employment. During this challenging time, I'm deeply grateful to the many hundreds of people and prominent organizations who've raised their voices in defense of the principles of academic freedom including the nearly 18,000 individuals who have signed a petition demanding corrective action and the numerous faculty around the world who are boycotting the university until I am reinstated. The students and instructors gathered here have shown themselves to be exemplars of everything to which a university should aspire. I'm here to reaffirm my commitment to teaching and to a position with the American Indian Studies program at UIUC. <laughs> I reiterate the demand that the university recognize the importance of respecting the faculty's hiring decision and reinstate me. It is my sincere hope that I can, as a member of this academic institution, engage with the entire university community in a constructive conversation about the substance of my viewpoints on Palestinian human rights and about the values of academic freedom. This is, as we say in my profession, a teaching moment. We must all strive together to make the most of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Salida. I'm going to introduce the rest of the speakers and then we'll be taking questions from the media afterwards. Um, we'll also have copies of Professor Salida's statement and the press release available after as well. Um, we'll f we've, I'll introduce everyone now and then people can just come up when they speak. Uh, first, we're gonna have Professor Robert Warrior, who's Director of American Indian Studies here at Illinois. Then we'll have Michael Rothberg, who's head of the English Department and he'll be speaking on behalf of the Modern Language Association. 
And then we have graduate students here at Il Illinois, Iman Ghanayam and Rico kleinstein Genyak. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out today. I'm reminded of coming here in 1992, uh, this exact same room when uh, I came to speak at the University of Illinois. I didn't know very much about the mascot controversy that was, uh, uh, that was roiling the campus then, and I came into a room very much like this one right now, people hanging off the rafters, and I said, what have I gotten myself into? Then I took a job here, and I said, what have I gotten myself into? And now I say, what have I gotten myself into, and what did I get poor Steve Saleta into? Uh, but it's been also a very heartening time to see so many people from the University of Illinois come together to take back the, the campus uh, uh, to, uh, to, to its rightful owners, the people who, who it belongs to, uh, everybody, uh, everybody here, the faculty, the students, uh, and the people of Illinois. So uh, I want to thank you for coming out today. Uh, I also want to just uh, uh, briefly, if I could, uh, uh, take a moment to uh, say thank you to uh, all of the people who've uh, been such wonderful uh, support for those who've been embroiled in all of this. Uh, my wife, Margaret Kelly, who's a faculty member, came out uh, today, and I want to say thank you to her. Uh, I also want to uh, point out uh, uh, Diana um, Stevens' uh, wife, who's here today. I want her to actually stand up so we can um, all say thank you to her. I know this can't have been a very easy time for her, and I always think that uh, how, how lonely it was that first day when, when that uh, note came to me from uh, Chancellor Wise saying that she had reached this decision. And within hours, I had people uh, reaching out to me here on our campus. Uh, Jody Bird, my colleague, was at my house that night. I was getting phone calls from my colleagues who were saying, what can we do? By the next day, there were people who were surrounding us. By Tuesday, I had thousands of people asking what they could do to help. And we were having meetings. We were surrounded by people. Now there are thousands uh, who are around us. But I've always thought that entire time that, that Stevens had to do so much of this uh, by himself. Uh, and, uh, but he's never been exactly by himself. He's had uh, Diana and their son, Stevens' family, and others. And uh, so I know that it's been a very tough time for them. And it's, it's nice to see them so intact. And I know that's because of their bravery, their spirit, and the uh, rock hard commitment they have to uh, the things that they believe in. And so I want to thank them for teaching us a lesson in that regard. I also want to say a thank you to my colleagues in American Indian Studies who not only so faithfully took out, uh, who played their part in doing a search that brought us uh, the, the uh, candidacy of Steve Salida uh, and that we turned into a, a job offer for him through all of the usual channels, through all of the usual ways that we bring somebody uh, to uh, fruition in a search like this. Uh, but who also took a very brave step uh, back in the middle of August uh, when we met and uh, I placed a motion before them to uh, vote no confidence in the chancellor uh, and, uh, and in the spirit of that same vote really in the president and the board of trustees. Uh, I'd like them to stand, those, are one, those who are here uh, today, including our postdocs and, and, and our, um, everyone else who's here. They may be out there in the hallway for all I know. I see Vince, I see Jody. I know that uh, Kevin was here, Marisa, uh, Brenda, and others. I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to write something, an, an article about how a tiny little community at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, including people like Stephen Kaufman, who's here, uh, took on the state of Illinois and changed things and made things better. Uh, and that started back in the early 1990s with people like Charlene Teeters and others who managed to uh, make a real tectonic shift here over, over the issue of, uh, over the university of the, the mascot here at, at Illinois. And I see it once again in their spirit uh, as, they've, as they've made, uh, as they've stood up uh, for the, doing the right thing. Uh, which is very heartening to me. I also have asked uh, the uh, uh, executive officers, the chairs, the um, heads of uh, the programs who've also gone on, the 10 other programs as of, as of uh, today who voted no confidence. Many of them are here. Some of them are not uh, probably able to stand because they're already standing or they're way back in there. But I've seen uh, some of them like David Price, Michael Rothberg, Marcus Keller, 
I think that uh, Andrew Orta said he could be here. If you're one from one of those uh, departments, uh, Lilia Kagasnovsky told me she could be here. Um, uh, Kirk Sanders. I don't know if Diane Conker. Uh, if, if I didn't mention your name, I just want to say thank you for my colleagues in American Indian Studies for, for standing for what is right, but also standing with us. Uh, when we took that, that brave step, I think that, that you joining us in that um, uh, told us that we had done the right thing, and we appreciate you doing the right thing along with us. And um, in doing that, we're trying to make the campus a better place. We're also trying to live out the mission of the university, as we always try to do, to make this a more excellent and better place uh, for all of us. It wasn't a political decision. It was a decision based on our idea that this needs to be a more excellent place in which we all do our research and our teaching. I was just on the quadrangle with a, a hearty group of uh, mainly uh, students, but some faculty, graduate students, undergraduates who were getting wet in order to make a point. And I, I want to recognize them as well and say to those who are many of them who have a sideways eye, they think that somehow, uh, uh, and I am with them on this, that the, uh, that the eye has fallen on its side, uh, the, uh, the block eye of Illinois has fallen on its side and is now actually suppressing the speech of many of us on our campus. I want to recognize them and say thank you to them as well. That they've become teachers as well. Many of them are teachers because they're graduate students who are teaching in our classrooms. Many people who have signed letters are, 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 are not just graduate students and students, but also non-tenure track teachers here at the university who have their own very important issues, as do people from, uh, from the um, AFSCME uh, union uh, uh, who are, are struggling right now to get their issues heard by the board of trustees, the chancellor, and the president. Uh, all of us standing together, I think, need to, need to remain together to see the ways in which the issues that we're, we're facing and confronting are joined together and they lead us to one place and it's to the board, the president, the chancellor, to these two buildings on our campus, to Swanland and to, and to uh, uh, Henry, uh, and to continue to, to, to press and to make our voices heard uh, and to not allow people to silence us in the ways that they have. Uh, I want to say something uh, that I said on the quad uh, when we were under umbrellas and say it here as well. Sorry if I'm saying it again to those of you who were there. Um, uh, but I had a conversation before, before I knew that this appointment was in peril uh, with the chancellor. And by then, we were getting wind that, that there were people who were unhappy with the decision by American Indian Studies to appoint Stephen to this, to this position. Uh, I asked Chancellor Wise in that conversation. She had asked to have a conversation with me and I knew it was about uh, Stephen's personal Twitter account. I asked her very clearly and during that conversation, did you read the entirety of that Twitter account? Uh, she uh, indicated by saying that from what she had read numerous times in that conversation uh, that she hadn't. I said, you know, there are people in your office who know how to access an entire Twitter account. I hope you will avail yourself of seeing at least the last month of all of those tweets. Uh, I know people in your office, I've met them, I know that they can show you the entirety of what's been done in the last month. If you want to see all the way back in time, don't tell me you don't have a Twitter account. The whole point of Twitter is anybody can go back and see a public Twitter account. You can see every single thing that Stephen has ever written on his Twitter account. You can see what I've written on my Twitter account. Anybody who puts it up there who hasn't edited it out, you can see it. Uh, but she said, the things that I've been reading lead me to say that this is unacceptable for a faculty member at the University of Illinois to say. I say, well, maybe you need, as, I, as I've said often, uh, not often enough, but it keeps coming into my mind, you can make up your mind about any issue based on as little information as you'd like. But as a scholar and as a teacher, I always encourage people to dig just a little bit deeper than that and as deep as they're able as often as possible. I encourage people to follow Stephen's example and to keep trying and to keep learning, to keep learning from the example of our students who are teachers in this teachable moment, I think, 
in them learning more and teaching us in helping us to see that it's worth continuing to fight for things that are right, standing up to power, and telling those in power that just because they have power doesn't mean they're the only people that matter. I've learned that in conversations like those with people who are chancellors, college presidents, who I first worked for a college president when I was an undergraduate at Pepperdine University out in California, that I've learned in having conversations with people who are presidents and chancellors that they get to, they get to decide what we talk about, whether it's on an airplane or in a car or in their office, on the phone, they get to kind of lead the conversation. But I thought, given that this was going to be a conversation, no doubt, about, about, uh, about Stephen Salida, that the conversation was going to turn around to teaching at some point. So I got all of the things we gathered about Stephen's teaching, things that, that he had put together so when we put his tenure file together, we could examine what kind of teacher he would likely be. Uh, and in that file we had teaching evaluations, we had the different sorts of things you put together when, when, you, uh, uh, when you do the sort of vetting that you do for this sort of thing. Uh, and I had it all in front of me on my two screens at home that I look at when, I, when I'm working at home. And I thought, okay, when the chancellor brings this up, when she says to me, Robert, I need to know, what kind of teacher will Stephen be? We never had that conversation. Instead, she told me during this conversation what kind of teacher she had decided that Steve Salida would be based on some tweets, some tweets that she had been sent by people who had an agenda that she wanted to tell me about. Now, so I have my notes from that conversation. I know she takes notes on every conversation she has. Maybe our notes don't match up, but I have my version. She has her version. And uh, I know that she talked to the board the next day. At that point, she never told me that this, that this, uh, that this appointment was in peril. Uh, but she did tell me she wanted me to tell Stephen Salida some things. She told me that to tell him that his, uh, that, that his uh, social media presence would be monitored to make sure that he was not using university equipment on university time, on university property to say things like he had said, uh, that, that, uh, and, that, uh, and that she found what he said to be unacceptable. That we live in a town where we have to shop together at Target and at Sam's Club and that we have to follow a different set of rules here in little Champaign-Urbana. I still don't quite know what that means. <laughs> uh, but it was something she wanted me to convey to him, which I did in a very embarrassed fashion on that following Saturday night after I thought that all of this had passed and that he'd be joining us in a couple of weeks. I asked her in that conversation, I said, I'm willing to say those things in some fashion to Steve Salida that you're, as long as I get to say that they're from you, not from me, and that I disagree with them, if you will at least, if you'll at least say to me, I hope that you'll say to me, you can't insist on anything with the Chancellor, I've also found out, I hope, Chancellor Wise, that you will have a face-to-face -face conversation with Steve Salida someday where you can have this conversation with him. Because I know that if you ever do sit down with him, face to face. You will find him to be, as I have known him to be for many, many years, a person who is engaging, who is deeply concerned with all of the things you're talking about, who cares about what other people think, who would never step into a classroom to try to impose an agenda on other people, who wants students to learn, to be critical thinkers, to be wonderful citizens of the world. Uh, last thing that I'll say before I, uh, before I make way for uh, the next speaker, Michael Rothberg, is to say this is kind of an inside baseball kind of thing that my fellow faculty members out there will maybe understand. I remember looking at Stephen's record in his curriculum vita, and as an administrator, I saw one item in it where I said, oh, thank goodness. Stephen's colleagues in English at uh, Virginia Tech had put him in charge of a program there for the undergraduate, uh, undergraduate English program where they had to kind of go through the drill of learning how to be an English major. And so his colleagues had put him in charge of that. And it made me think like, oh, finally, we have somebody who knows what they're doing 
with the curriculum. And this is finally somebody that I can turn to to say, he'll be able to take our curriculum and I'll put him in charge of that committee. And this was a signal to me of the person who would be collegial, who would know how to run a committee like that. You only put people in charge of committees like that when they actually are excellent teachers who can say to the people around the room, no, 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 we're gonna do this because this is what works in the classroom. All of this is to say to you, this is a person who we're missing right now as a teacher on our campus. Thank you very much. Reinstate Steve Salida. Hello, I'm Michael Rothberg. I'm a professor and head of the Department of English, and I'm a, the director of the initiative in Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies here at the University of Illinois. Um, I've spoken publicly uh, about this case on my own behalf, but I'm here today as a member of the Modern Language Association of America, and I've agreed at the request of the MLA president, Margaret Ferguson, to read a statement composed for this occasion and approved yesterday by the MLA's Executive Council. Founded in 1883, the Modern Language Association of America is one of the world's largest scholarly organizations. It is dedicated to promoting the study and teaching of languages and literatures through its programs, publications, and advocacy work. The MLA has nearly 28,000 members in approximately 100 countries. And here is the MLA's statement. Professor Robert Warrior, director of the University of Illinois American Indian Studies Program, invited a representative from the MLA to speak at today's press conference because Professor Stephen Salaita is a member of the MLA and also because the MLA's Executive Council sent a letter to Chancellor Phyllis Wise on August 15th that is relevant to this event. In its letter, the MLA Executive Council urged the Chancellor to reconsider her decision to rescind the offer of a tenured professorship that the American Indian Studies program had made to Professor Salida last fall. The members of the MLA's Executive Council felt that the revocation of the offer to Professor Salida on August 1st just two weeks before his appointment was to have begun, was troubling on two counts. First, the decision seemed to abrogate long-established principles of academic due process. And second, the decision seemed to violate principles of academic freedom of expression. In the light of recent developments, which include Chancellor Wise's acknowledgement to University of Illinois students that the decision to revoke Professor Salaita's appointment was not hers, but rather was prompted by the Board of Trustees, the MLA Executive Council wishes to reaffirm its stated view that the rescinding of Professor Salaita's offer is a troubling response to his expression of views about a significant and controversial topic. In its statement on academic freedom, the MLA is on record as believing that, quote, when academic freedom is curtailed, higher education is compromised. Furthermore, the MLA has for years called on college and university administrators and faculty members to support a culture of academic freedom for all teachers, regardless of rank and status. Believing that the right to express unpopular views on important issues in various media is critical to the health of our democratic society and to its institutions of higher education, the MLA Executive Council calls once again on Chancellor Wise and on the University of Illinois Board of Trustees to redress what seems an unjustified decision. Thanks. <clears throat> we are Jewish and Palestinian graduate students in American Indian Studies supported by the Intersect Grant for Interdisciplinary Global Indigenous Research. We come together to demand the reinstatement of Professor Salida as part of the core group of seven undergraduate and graduate students who have been tirelessly organizing demands, petitions, letters, and actions since we first learned of Professor Salida's firing. 
We are here today because the administration's actions endanger our diverse community by not only producing an environment that scholars, artists, and our fellow students now avoid and boycott, but also an environment that, not on, that only permits speech empty of indigenous, ethnic, and racially specific narratives and controversial politics. My name is Iman Ghanayem. I'm a second year international student from Palestine via Jordanian citizenship, doing my PhD in English and American Indian studies. My own narrative of Palestinian dispossession has led me to do research on comparative indigenous studies. I heard of Professor Salata's firing while in Jordan after returning from Palestine during the most recent Israeli assault on Gaza this summer, whose effects and ramifications I witnessed firsthand. Upon hearing the news, I became sick and depressed and was forced to reconsider whether I should come back to the American Indian Studies pro program I love now that the university administration had demonstrated that it does not welcome or grasp Palestinian scholars and our, and our scholarship. I was supposed to build on Professor Salaita's expertise in my own studies since he is the foremost comparative American Indian and Palestinian studies scholar. Now that he has been fired, my research and its burgeoning field has been seriously jeopardized by my own university. Another reason why this scandal impacts me personally is that the administration ignores the ethnic cleansing and policing of Palestinians within that the administration ignores the ethnic cleansing and policing of Palestinians within and outside the limited space we are granted, from which Professor Salaita speaks, the direct context of his tweets, and most importantly, the scarcity of Palestinian bodies on this campus, or even the value of our presence. My name is Rico Kleinstein Chenyek. I am a Latina and Jewish, queer, genderqueer, and disabled MD PhD student in the Institute of Communications Research and the College of Medicine. I am the grandchild of a woman who fled the Holocaust from Berlin, was a refugee in Shanghai, China, and while in search of a Jewish haven, committed suicide in Rehovot, Israel, because she realized Israel was not a state designed to protect Jews and survivors like herself. I cannot allow the University of Illinois to fire Professor Salida for speaking out against the genocide of his own people, especially as the administration does so under the false pretense of academic freedom and protection of us as students. As a future physician scholar who researches the regulation of dissent during health crises, it is imperative that we understand the firing of Professor Salida as a health issue when he is being punished for speaking out against human rights violations to support justice and livelihood. To protest against the university's actions is a means of protecting our physical and mental health, which the university has been jeopardizing in its blatant disregard of faculty shared governance, student demands, and overall freedom to dissent. Many have made assumptions about how Professor Salida's presence on campus would affect the campus and, campus and classroom with clear disregard of his teaching record um, and student reviews from Virginia Tech, which are now easily accessible on supportstevensalida.com. I quote Jim Hunter here. As a student, I never felt discriminated against. I was never the victim of anti-Semitism. And even though I occasionally disagreed with Dr. Salida, I never felt that my opinions were ignored or demeaned. And I never witnessed anything like this happening. In other words, I believe the university is the victim of misinformation. Regardless of whatever is on Twitter or screes from his detractors, Dr. Salida conduct, conducts himself as a professional committed to the bedrock principles of all, academic, all academics hold dear. We are supporting Professor Salida, not because we want to destroy the university and its administration, but because we want to protect it from destroying itself. If the administration does not... Yeah. 
If the administration does not choose to reinstate Professor Salaita during Thursday's Board of Trustees meeting, the worldwide boycott and on-campus protests will only escalate exponentially. As long as Professor Salaita does not have his position and the university continues to disregard American Indian Studies autonomy, all of our indigenous ethnic all of our indigenous ethnic gender and other interdisciplinary departments will cease to function. We encourage our peers, colleagues, and community members to join us in pursuing our chancellor and the board of trustees to reinstate Professor Salaita and to defend our university. We thank you. Thank you for those powerful statements. We'll be taking questions from the media. If folks do have questions, if you could first state your name and your outlet before you do, that would be appreciated. Thank you. The, the question is, is that the chancellor has stated yesterday that there's no chance of reinstatement. What is the alternative plan? Uh, at this point, Professor Salaita is here to ask for the opportunity to be reinstated. We understand what the chancellor has said. The chancellor has also made statements acknowledging some mistakes in how this was handled. Professor Salaita appreciates those statements. This is an opportunity, as Prof Professor Salaita has said, for the university to make the right decision for everybody to identify a positive message from this and move forward together in a forward-looking fashion. And that's what Professor Salaita is here to do, to tell everyone he is excited about the opportunity to join this institution and that he will work with this administration, that he will commit to principles of uh, a, to a kind of decorum in the classroom that has been his commitment throughout his academic career so far and will continue to be his commitment in the classroom and on campus at the University of Illinois. Professor Salaita is hopeful that that process will be successful, and he is committed to working with the university amicably on shared ideals. But Professor Salaita is, of course, prepared to pursue his legal remedies if that is necessary. And that will include seeking essentially injunctive relief, the idea that he will ask a court to require the university to complete the appointment process and reinstate him. No, I, I haven't spoken with anybody. Have, she's asking if I've spoken with any of the uh, members of the boards of, uh, of the board of trustees, and the, the answer is no, I haven't. I haven't spoken with the chancellor or anybody from the board. Oh, okay, um, the, the question is, um, and if I'm summarizing it incorrectly, uh, you know, let, let me know, uh, you know, why, you know, some people are wondering why I would want to, 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 to work here after all of this has happened and, and whether it might be uncomfortable. Um, and the, <laughs> the answer is, um, the answer is in this room. Um, the, 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 the answer is in this room. It would be one of the greatest honors of my life to work here among such committed, decent, um, motivated students and, and faculty and, and, and staff in, the, in a wonderful community that um, I, I don't think that it would need to be uncomfortable at all. I think that we would have a lot of interesting conversation and discussion and that we would we would begin the process of, of making the, the university community whole again. Hey. 
<laughs> That's a good question. She asked if I would uh, plan on, on tweeting differently going forward. I, uh, I, you know, um, Twitter is the kind of medium that in which, you know, argument is happening in, in real time amid a, a sort of a rush of reactions and perspectives and sometimes very, very harsh discourse coming in on, on, on people's feeds. So the way that, that I've, I've always tweeted sort of has to do with what's happening in the moment politically and, and discursively. So I, I can't say that, that, um, that you know, there's a, a particular style of tweeting to which I adhere at, at all times. If you look at my Twitter feed, you'll see that, that there are way more expressions of, of humanism than, than there are of what the university has been calling um, incivility. And in the end, I feel like it, it, in, the case, in, in the case of what's happening now, it matters little. I've always been a devoted teacher. I've never imposed my viewpoints on students. I've never told them that they need to believe something. I've never graded them based on what opinions they express. Instead, I've always taught students to think critically and that whatever argument that you raise is fine as long as that argument has an evidentiary basis, as long as there's evidence attached to it, and as long as, as your argument is, is, is supported by a preponderance of evidence rather than mere speculation. And so in the classroom, I wouldn't change my style. My style is, is to be open to encourage my students, uh, to speak civilly with, with students, and to do my best to make sure that students leave my class knowing how to write and think Right? at least just a little bit better than they did when they entered into the class. And I think that's, that's uh, um, what's most important. Um, it was um, about the, um, the, the, the chaplain who was um, let go of his position at Yale University recently for, for tweeting something uh, um, critical of, of Israel and, you know, wh whether I could comment on the, uh, you know, on, on, on the situation in light of mine and in the broader context of, of what seems to be happening on college campuses. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know specifically about um, the, the case at, at Yale or the, the case of, of the student at Ohio University. I'm sort of following these things passingly right now, so I don't feel like I know enough to, you know, to comment definitively on them. But, you know, I would say that academic freedom and, and freedom of speech both always have to be reinvigorated and protected. There are always powerful forces right, in the world that, that are looking to limit the amounts of things that we as citizens can say. And it's, it's, it's a constant process of sort of reaffirming right, our, our values and reaffirming our commitment right, to the ability to speak without, um, without recrimination, right, without uh, um, losing our jobs in, in in academe, and I, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Maria and others uh, did a good job in, in their comments sort of pointing to the fact that there's a long history on uh, American uh, university campuses of punishing those who are deemed to be unacceptably critical of, of Israel. And I think that it's, it's an issue that we need to continue to think closely about and identify source, some of the, the, the fault lines where this issue places people in, in unjust and untenable positions. Okay. Um, go ahead. 
So the question is, is, is why didn't Professor Salida, why hasn't he said anything, why has he been silent until now, and why did he choose today to speak? Uh, yeah, go, I, mean, I mean, Professor Salida has, has basically been, you know, trying to engage in a discussion with the university to see about being reinstated. He has uh, been looking for an opportunity to uh, eventually come and show support and really to show thanks for all of you who have come out in support of him. And so, in large part, what, what Professor Salaita wants to accomplish here today is to really thank everyone uh, who has been supporting him, who has been an ally for him, and stood for some, uh, some very important principles. Sorry, can you identify yourself? I guess what I'll say is, you know, we have been in communication with the university. Uh, I don't want to say much more than that. I really don't. Um, I, I really don't have an opinion on that. Um, I think that there are strict uh, protocols and processes and bylaws that that govern, you know, the, the system of hiring and, and firing on any campus. And you know, I, I I don't know what the familiar or relevant ones would be in this case. Mm -hmm. It seems like quite a process here. Right. Yeah. I, I, first of all, I've, I've, I, I've, I've, you know, I've really never seen anything like this. This is, um, <laughs> this is, this is absolutely, this is absolutely remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. But I, I, you know, I, I don't know of. There have been controversial, um, you know, hirings and firings in, in academe for, you know, for some time. It, it's always going to come with, with, with the territory of higher education, but I, I really can't think of any other case um, like mine in which, you know, I, I had one foot in the door already. Um, you know, my, uh, my dossier had been approved by um, all of the relevant committees at all of the necessary levels here at, at the university. Um, I, I had my foot in the door already. I, I'd come to, uh, to Champaign-Urbana twice already, you know, looking for housing and sort of getting the move in order. We'd, we'd had our moving van, um, you know, our moving truck set up with a date. Uh, my classes had been assigned. I'd already ordered my books. And so, you know, kind of the, the I won't even say the 11th hour, right? The 11th hour and 45th minute, you know, sort of uh, uh, nature of, of, of the, 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 the termination is, is um, it, it seems to me highly un, un, unusual, and I, I think that's part of the reason why, uh, you know, this situation has drawn so much interest because um, it, it, it seems to be um, uh, a little bit of a, a moving of the ball in terms of, of what normally happens in cases where, where um, you know, there are some questions about, um, you know, a, a person who's going to be hired. I do. Um, I, I'm, I, I, to, you know, to add just a little bit more, I'm, um, I, I see it also as a form of, of, of speech and political expression, and I support the right of anybody to organize around issues of what they consider to be deep injustice, right? That, that is our right as, as American citizens, that's our right as, as students and, and faculty, and I don't think on principle, um, you know, I, I really have any problem anytime when anybody um, um, articulates and expresses those rights.
there's no question that if there is litigation, there will be uh, an intensive document uh, retrieval process that will in involve uh, trying to get at the heart out of exactly what the motivation was for this decision. Uh, we think, you know, based on what's already known, uh, the university is going to have some very hard arguments. Um, but we will learn a lot, uh, and we will also uh, be able to take depositions. Uh, and that is an opportunity to, to ask, sit people down and ask them about their role in this process, their decision making, uh, and other things. So, uh, again, Professor Salaita's goal is not to have to go down that road, um, but he is prepared to do so if necessary. Professor Salaita is, as, as we said, and I, and I hate to say it again, he is really focused. The, the, the question was whether or not a financial settlement is, is available or something he would consider. The answer is that is not his goal. His goal is to be reinstated at the university. And look, the, re, the reality... <laughs> the re university has taken the position that the reason Professor Salaita, you know, they took the actions they did and are not allowing his uh, appointment to go forward does not have anything to do with the ideas or opinions of certain wealthy donors. If that is indeed the case, there should be nothing that prevents this from going forward for the Chancellor, relevant Board of Trustee members to hear the comments of Professor Salaita, to talk with Robert Warrior and other professors to understand this academic's history as a teacher, his, his his absolutely stellar teacher evaluations, to understand from him, as he's communicated many times today, that he believes in the importance of civil, thoughtful debate, including shared and, and differing opinions. In light of those facts, there's no reason they shouldn't be willing to go forward if their position is indeed true. Sorry, okay, one more question from Jody. That's just not something we're, we're, we're prepared to... The question was, when would he file a lawsuit? Um, we're just not at that point yet to be, to be making that kind of decision. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you all for being here. Again, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. One, one second, please. I, I just, I, I want from the, the bottom of my heart to, to thank everybody, particularly the students who have done such amazing work organizing, um, you know, just, you know. Professor Warrior and the American Indian Studies program, uh, a program that I would be tremendously proud to become a part of uh, based on their, their commitment to scholarship and uh, their, their ethics. Uh, it's, it's just a fantastic group of people. Professor Rothberg also, I'm, I'm, I'm just honored to be in his company and to, to you. Thank you so much. This is one of the proudest moments of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.